Upon this second semester, I do realize that not only do I study musicality before, and it certainly has been a long time since I myself occupied the seat at the Rasivini. A long time ago, when I had my undergraduate introductory psychology, I had it right here in this Wallace Lecture Theatre. And I used to sit right over there, in that seat there, and from that vantage point I can absorb many of the interesting and exciting things presented by the very inter interesting and talented lecturers here at the School of Psychology in the University of Sydney. But now I have this great opportunity to teach, so I will begin with something very basic for you. It's again, I like to play, it's, it's called Goldilocks and Three Bear. Do you want to go now and find out who it is that is sitting in my chair? Hello, how are you? He's such a nice guy, isn't he? All right, I'm just kidding. But one thing I'm not thinking about. <laughs> one thing that I'm not kidding about is the fact that it only seems like yesterday that I myself was a, uh, a student, a graduate student in Psychology 1 here at the University of in this very lecture theatre. But now I do have this extraordinary privilege to be able to stand here and teach you beautiful people who I hope will find refreshing comfort in today's lecture because it assumes no prior knowledge about some neurons or any of that gooey stuff that can get in the way of appreciating a very simple message and that is, is this problem. How is it that we are able to perceive the world around us? How is it that you know a flower is a flower in all its beauty? Whether it's by sight, or its smell. How is it that you know the person sitting to your left is the one that's creating that horrible body odor? Might be the person sitting in front of you, or it might even be you. We get all this information that we can use in our environment, so we know where to sit, and it's quite extraordinary just how we're able to gather all this information. It's my hope that uh, regardless of what you decide to, to pursue after this course, whether you decide to get pissed off with psychology altogether and give it up because it's just too hard, or branch out in other areas of psychology, such as abnormal, developmental, social, clinical, so many different types of psychology you can get into, or even other sciences, or even artistic endeavour. I hope you've been able to employ and apply the many principles you'll learn in perceptual systems and, uh, and, and be able to uh, make use of them, at least some, some, at some point in the future. Uh, for it's, uh, I hope you can appreciate your ability to reason also and your ability to uh, uh, make effective observations. For it's your observations and the accuracy in which you record them that is going to prove useful at least some stage, crucial for your future success. So I thought I'd begin today's lecture by just putting your observations to the test with a little demonstration, but before I do, you'll note that uh, the lower right hand side of the display, I've got these numbers, They're all these slides are numbers, so you can write notes if you really want to, you don't have to, write some notes and put a little number next to it and put a box around it, and after this lecture I'll upload all the slides by before 5 o'clock and you can download them and associate your notes with them. So, let me present you with my demonstration number one. We have this rotating silhouette of uh, a woman, or it could be uh, a man with uh, modifications. <laughs> Imagine the figure is spinning upon a clock face. Who sees it rotating clockwise? Yeah, Who sees it rotating anti-clockwise? Okay. Right. You're all being presented with the same sensory information, the same visual information. But half of you are choosing to see it one way, 
and half of you choosing to see it the other way. You're perceiving it very differently. You're seeing the same input, but you're choosing to adopt different percepts. Isn't that fascinating? I'm going to change it slightly now and uh, just pay attention. And I'll just ask you again. Who sees it rotating clockwise? Okay, no one this time. Who sees it rotating anti-clockwise? Okay, all of you. Right? You've all just been experimenters and participants in this little study where we've just demonstrate that, demonstrated that illumination provides all this additional information that we can use. Textual information, shading information, which provides information about shape as well as shadows, all help to disambiguate the direction of rotation in that spinning figure. And the figure is uh, completely ambiguous, as you see there. That rotating silhouette could have been produced by either clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation. But how is it that we're able to get this information that we can use to make reliable and accurate observations about the world around us and what's going on? That's essentially the problem of perception. And my name is Juno Kim. <laughs> my office number is 304 Griffin Taylor. That's where I usually am not. And, but you can contact me via email at juno at suckerdc.au. Also, I have a website where I put uh, some stuff with, uh, of some interest. There's a nice photo of me without glasses. But yes, my name is uh, Juno Kim. I am half Korean. I believe it is South Korean, not North Korean. But uh, who knows? <laughs> I never knew my father. Unlike people who were born yesterday, I don't have the privilege of saying I was named after the delightfully funny movie starring the beautiful Ellen Page. No, I was actually named after the original Juno, the ancient Roman goddess of womanhood and childbirth. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. My symbols are apparently a pomegranate and a peacock. That's a male bird. And this is what I look like when I'm not lecturing. <laughs> so, uh, it comes to a consultation or we'll ask me a question. We'll try to look for something stressed like this around the Griffin Taylor building. If you can't find this, just look for the trail of pomegranates with people. Uh, this is an image of uh, a statue of the, the ancient Greek version of Juno. This is Kina, uh, the wife of Shul. And you can see that she's standing there sort of holding something in her right hand, like a bottle of perfume. In the left hand, she's got some kind of frisbee or something, because that's what they did back then. And she's wearing these clothes, which are completely unfashionable by today's standards, but you know, fashion trends how they roll over. This might be the thing soon, and I've got mine in the closet, and I hope it's going to work. We get all this information out of this one image. Another source of information that we're able to get out of this image is the location of the camera person, or the observer, looking at the statue, standing somewhere to the right of it. There are perspective cues contained in it that allow us to extract it and infer that information. So from this one image, we're able to extract a whole array of information. But when you think about it, it's just a big rectangle comprised of all these luminance variations, patterns of light. But when you look at it, you see so much more. That's essentially where perception delineates from sensation. Because sensation just refers to how your uh, senses, for example, your sight, transforms uh, physical properties of the world, such as patterns of light, into uh, uh, neural messages, electrical potentials that relay to the brain. That's where sensation ends. Perception is the process of turning those signals into meaningful experience about the physical world, such as uh, familiar faces, recognizing familiar faces to a family dog. Perception, according to your textbook, is the ability of our brain to select, organize, and interpret the sensory information that it receives. So if there's a tiger coming through this uh, doorway here, I want to be able to look over there, I want to be able to recognize the tiger, I want to respond to that appropriately, getting scared and running away and leaving you guys to fend yourself. No, I wouldn't do that. I don't, I don't want to look over there and see patterns of light. I don't, I don't want to look over there and just see cuddly bits of orange, black and yellow fur. Just, that would yeah, evoke a very different response from me. I want to look over there, I want to perceive the tiger so I can make the appropriate res response. But in order to make that response, I have to perceive it first. So essentially, perception involves two crucial questions. What information is out there in the world that I need to know about? And what mechanisms does my brain possess in order to access or apprehend that information so that I can use it? So in essence, 
How does our brain select, organise and interpret the sensory information it receives? We live in this world of energy, man. There's like energy all around. And if you, uh, like me, were able to stay awake during high school physics, <coughs> you'd at least be able to remember uh, one of the core principles, and that's the law of conservation of energy. Everyone's familiar with this? That energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form to another. So we live in this world of energy, all these different forms of energy around us, and we've evolved all these senses with specialised receptors that interact with those different forms of energy and convert them into neural messages. So for example, when two objects collide, they create sound waves that travel through the air, resonate little cancel receptors located in our inner ears, and uh, that creates neural messages that we need to hear stuff. But fortunately, we have many of these sensors. We have at least six of them. You probably thought you only had five, because that's what they teach in Hindi. But uh, we do. We have more than that. We have uh, at least six. So, in a, so you can go home and tell your, your, your mum that you have a sixth sense, and uh, she'll uh, be nice to you all week. And she may discern you, who knows? In addition, in addition to uh, vision and hearing, we also have a sense of touch. We have mechanoreceptors and free nerve endings embedded in our skin that respond to temperature and pressure. So that we can feel something to form a somatic sensation. We have uh, taste bud receptors embedded in our tongue that respond to the presence of chemicals and foods so that allows us to experience the, the taste of a, a good bit of food or the sweetness of an apple. Also have uh, odor receptors situated at the top of our nasal cavity that respond to uh, chemicals in the form of vapours. So that's olfaction, it allows us to smell stuff. Like the vapours coming from that guy's armpit sitting next to you. So in addition to the primary five senses, we also have an additional one that's shown there. That's a vestibular apparatus, or the vestibular sense, which is located in, in the inner ear. And that responds to inertial forces applied to that head and allows me to sense gravity so I can stand here and lecture. If I had an inactive vestibular system, I would be all my clothes up. I'd be flopping around on the floor like a fish and I'd, I'd definitely be vomiting everywhere as well, wherever the people in the front rows had first hand experience of that. It's, it's not, it's not the... I'm going to start with uh, vision because uh, vision is uh, really cool. We have this big massive display that allows me to present to you uh, a whole array of uh, different visual illusions. But vision is also good because uh, I can demonstrate many of the core concepts and principles that you encounter in conceptual systems regardless of what sense we're dealing with. So we'll spend a bit of time on vision, but we'll look at those other things as well in the middle. So I'll we'll spend some time on vision at the beginning and the end of this uh, lecture series. But when we look at the world, we see light. We see by way of light. We don't interact with objects directly because that might hurt our eye. We experience objects through the light that their surfaces reflect. And one of the most salient or obvious differences we can experience in objects is that some surfaces can, surfaces of objects can be dark and some can be light. Dark surfaces tend to have a lower reflectance and uh, you see here, that means they absorb lots of, lots of light and reflect proportionally more. Uh, absorb lots of light and reflect proportionally less. Shown by those short arrows. Whereas uh, surfaces that are light have a higher reflectance, that means they uh, absorb proportionally less and reflect proportionally more. That can be appreciated here with a simple equation. Luminance, or the intensity of light uh, reflected by a surface or presented in an image, is determined by the reflectance of that surface multiplied by the intensity of incident light that strikes the surface. You don't need to know this equation, it's just there for people who like to appreciate things symbolically. Uh, like some of the engineers who came here to pick up first the chicky babes. So it's uh, not something you need to know for this lecture. Uh, but it shows you the kinds of uh, computations that are involved. And uh, you may have some, some pre-misconceptions that uh, our visual system or our eyes work very similar to a camera. And uh, to some extent that's true. But to cameras, they don't perceive, they only sense stuff. You take a camera like this one, you read the lens, and you can find inside this CMOS sensor is comprised of all these you know, the thousands of photodiodes. You can see one of them here. When light strikes any one of these, uh, these photodiodes, it creates a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction travels down and uh, 
generates this uh, electrical potential, which you usually see structured in the form of bits and bytes in an image like this one. But all these pixels, they're all independent. They all sit in their own little box. They don't know anything about their neighbours, never look over the fence and have a yarn. Cameras only capture information about the pattern of light that's reflected by surfaces. And you can see that they just capture information that there's something bright over here, something dark over here, and something brighter yet again over here. The fact that you can see a face in this image is uh, your achievement, your ability to perceive that is allowing you to pull out the appearance of that face. And that's because you're integrating information across these pixels. Cameras don't do that. And that's because you are providing a solution to what is referred to as the inverse problem. We live in this 3D world, we receive 2D images of it through our eyes. But from these 2D images, we're able to extract a whole range of information about the location of objects and their uh, material properties, their shape, as well as their texture and colour. All able to get all this information from single images. It's an extraordinary feat of vision. Another extraordinary accomplishment of vision is the fact that we can recognise the same object across different viewing orientations, different sizes, different distances from us. As you see here, three shots of uh, Michelangelo's uh, David's backside. Probably never seen Michelangelo David's backside. Here it is, and this is how you would look if you saw a real, real one. You can recognise it in the same in all three cases because you're able to rotate these things in, the head, in your head so that you make comparisons. So we can do all this with our ability to perceive. But how is it that we're able to do all this? We're doing all these computations all the time. You probably thought you were really crap at mathematics at, at school, but your head is performing some kind of computations that are really, really sophisticated, right here, right now, to absorb this information. And the best scientists in the world, they don't even know entirely how you're doing it. It's a hard problem. The reason it's a hard problem is because there's no one solution. There's actually multiple solutions. What do, pe what do people see in this slide? They make out the appearance of a blue square on the left and uh, a crimson ball on the right. And that's the most obvious interpretation. Although the uh, structure on the left could be a three-dimensional one, chances are you know, when shown an object such as a cube, for example, a blue cube at random, in any viewing orientation, 360 degrees, you'd be able to see more than one face. The fact that you can only see one face here is a very improbable or accidental view. So you're more likely to adopt the appearance of uh, that structure as a square. That's somewhat ambiguous, but I can show you that in fact it is a cube. But so uh, one of the most uh, interesting things, important things, that to any unified theory of vision needs to account for is how we actually make these, uh, these inferences. If I now rotate this uh, view around now, you can see that the, the view of this cube is now partially blocked or occluded by the crimson ball in the foreground. But who can still make out the appearance of the blue cube? Right? It's because you're adopting a generic interpretation of what should be in that missing spot that you can't see, the occluded region. You don't perceive this thing here, this moldy Vulcan blue cheese. That's because the irregularity is carved into that, and it's so unlikely that that irregularity would be so perfectly aligned, accidentally aligned with the edge contour, edge boundary of that crimson ball. In most situations, in any random given situation, we wouldn't be able to identify that. So our brain is working all the time to try and give us the best possible answer and ensure the most likely state of affairs in our environment, even when we can't see that information, we don't have access to it. That's uh, demonstrated here, our, our brain uses all the information available to it. We have this uh, green cylinder upon a checkerboard and it's casting a shadow over tile B. If I were to ask you, if you would believe me, whether uh, tile A and B are the same luminance on this display, same shade of grey. Who would believe me? Right? A couple of you. Maybe you've seen this illusion before. <laughs> in fact, they are. And I can take screen captures of these and put them over here and you can see that they are the same, same shade of grey, same luminance. But when you see those patches in the context of that checkerboard, your brain, doing its computations, 
fact is in the information that there's a shadow cast over B. So B is initially receiving much, much less light. Whereas A is receiving direct illumination, initially receiving more light. So B is receiving less initially, but reflecting back to your eyes the same amount as A, then B must be the more efficient at doing that, must be the lighter. I'll give you an analogy. Imagine we have person A and person B. I give person A 100 units of the currency, person B 50 units of that currency. They both go out, they go shopping, and they call that current currency light. They come back, person A returns to me 40 units, person B returns to me the same amount, 40 units. Who spent more? Yep, person A. They went out, they spent 60% of what I gave them, they spoiled, and they returned to me 40%. Whereas uh, person B, they were a little, little more efficient. They went out, they went to Audi or something. And, uh, they spent 20% uh, 20, 20 of what they gave them. They absorbed 20%. They reflected back or returned back 80%. And these are the kinds of computations that your brain is doing all the time to try and make sense of the world around us. But as, as you saw in the previous slide, sometimes it, it uh, guesses wrong and sometimes it doesn't get it right. In this situation here, what do people see? There's a photograph of a building you can find in Melbourne. You have this staggered black and white tiling here and these horizontal orange lines. All these lines are all horizontal, they're all parallel. But when you look at it, it looks like they're staggered and walking relative to each other. Does everyone see that? This is the cafe wall illusion. It's called the cafe wall illusion because it was discovered on a cafe wall in a place called Bristol a long time ago by a student of uh, uh, Richard Gregory, a very prominent vision scientist. You can see a reconstruction of it over here. You get this warpiness when you look at the, uh, the stimulus. But now I'll show you some horizontal red lines. You can verify that they are all parallel. Superimpose them on the original and verify that. But now I remove them, then you get all this warpiness comes into effect. That warping isn't happening on this, happening on this display. That's happening inside your head. Your head is actually making that stuff warping. It's because it's doing these computations, trying to figure out why the hell would someone want to do such crappy tiling? <laughs> Some of you may be thinking uh, uh, it's really not that complicated. Uh, Perception is really easy because your your camera can do face detection. It's got this little viewfinder, puts a little box around a face. It can perceive. Camera companies have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, hundreds and hundreds of research scientists and engineers for years trying to work on this problem. How hard is it to find a face? It's pretty hard. You're getting better at it. There's still a long way off achieving what we can do with our own brains. They only construct algorithms that adhere to certain template computations that uh, take into account the fact that faces tend to be these uh, things that are arranged with two dark things and some features underneath. Ow, it's right here. But we, on the other hand, are very good in comparison at uh, doing these computations. We can recognize the faces upside down, inside out, and back to front. To demonstrate this, I'm just gonna hand it over to Richard Gregory, that uh, prominent vision size scientist who actually passed away in 2010. But uh, he'll just give you a rundown on the, the hollow face or hollow head delusion. This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction, and amazingly the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal, correct as it were, face, and wait again as it comes round, and you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde, both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in, that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave, as now. And then it will become the normal face again, there. 
And no, but as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear there, your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge. We have had so much experience looking at faces. We've spent our lives looking at faces. I've seen so many faces today, and I'm looking at so many faces now. And we have a very good understanding of how a face looks. It's usually upright with features in particular places most of the time. And we're so good at pulling out information about faces such that when we're presented with an image of an inside-out face, we can't help but pull that stimulus inside-out so we see it the right way around. What about an upside-down face? In the next slide, I'll show you an image of an upside-down face. And I just want you to call out as soon as you can who the person in the photo in the image is. That's right, it's uh, Tony Abbott. It's very hard to make out, isn't it? Yes, that's right, because you're not used to seeing him dressed like this. So used to seeing him dressed in other attire. That's right. Something more like this. <laughs> Put a bit of shake from shading happening there. But uh, this is demonstrating the face inversion effect. And it was re originally demonstrated by Yin in 1969 that uh, when presenting observers with upright versus inverted faces, people were a lot more confident, quicker, and, and uh, more accurate in making them identification of an upright face. When presented with an inverted face, they took longer, they were less confident, and they made more errors. They also showed that uh, when presenting their observers with uh, images of uh, non-faces, such as objects and uh, landscapes, they found that uh, presenting those, uh, those, those inanimate objects, either upright or inverted, or landscapes, upright or inverted, uh, people were, uh, were equally uh, good at, uh, at making identifications of those. So it shows that uh, our perception of faces is very special and involves some very uh, dedicated uh, uh, processing mechanisms. We've got those in place to deal with them. Now I'm going to do another one now and show you an upside down face. I just want you to call out again who it is. <coughs> That's right. It's Shrek's auntie. <laughs> We have Julia Gillard on the left there. You can see what's happening here. She'll be, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure she'll be queuing up next week to do her little steal. Uh, but uh, you can see what's happening here. All I've done is inverted the eyes and the mouth in the image. And uh, when you see that whole image upside down, such as you see those features the right way around, it's very hard to uh, identify those irregularities until you see them. Uh, presented on the upright face like that, where it's it's very strange, isn't it? Another one. Right. We have uh, on the left. <laughs> we have Kevin right on the left, and on the right we have Kevin Eleven. <laughs> I made this for all you Ben Ten fans. I'm actually a Ben Ten fan. It's one of my favourite cartoons. This is the uh, Margaret Thatcher illusion. It's called the Margaret Thatcher illusion because it was originally discovered by a guy who was defacing a photograph of Mrs. Margaret Thatcher. Does everyone know who Margaret Thatcher is? The former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom before Tony Blair. In his original article, uh, Thompson, 1980, states that, uh, however, figure two, which can be viewed by rotating the page through 180 degrees, reveals that we have been cruelly deceived by the smiling Mrs. Thatcher of figure one. Further, further research into this illusion might help determine whether face recognition is a serial or parallel process, and it might even tell us something more about Mrs. Margaret Thatcher. While making this uh, very political statement in this very reputable scientific journal, uh, Thompson shows here that uh, when you have those uh, inverted features, it's very hard to see much of a difference when, they're, when the whole face is inverted like that. But if you flip those images around now, rotate the page to 180 degrees, 
then you get a very big difference in the perceptual awareness of the perceptual awareness of those two lower figures. And now it's very clear which one is the deceptive Margaret Thatcher. It's the one on the left. Alright, I could do this all day, uh, but I'm going to limit, limit myself to one more. This guy is the uh, lead astronaut of the, the Canadian Space Agency. This is the guy that the Canadians want to send to Mars, and it's quite likely he'll get there because he, you know, Canadians are the ones with all the money for space research. He's been to Australia before. <laughs> and I uh, hear he's a, a big fan of uh, 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 Shannon Knoll. Illusions are cool, they're really interesting because they show us that we don't really know how the world around us is structured or organised. And it gives us some real-time insight into the brain's activity as it, as it occurs and how perceptual systems such as vision, visual perception, breaks down. Also reveals some of, some of the assumptions and general principles that we use to make uh, guesses or inferences about the physical world around us. In the case of uh, face perception, we're very good at segmenting or extracting information about the eyes and the nose and, and the lips. But uh, just extracting features, any one of those features alone, isn't enough for us to identify a face or determine whether that face is a producing a genuine smile, for example, which you've surely heard about, heard about in previous lectures. So we have to group that information together, pull it together. But what features go, to, go with what and what way around? This is where we get into the notion of perceptual grouping. I'll show you this. Now we have this uh, bunch of lines on the page, but you may not see it as 12 independent lines. You group that information together and see this three-dimensional object, that of a cube, the neck of cube. And it's ambiguous because you can either see it with the lower left face popping out at you or the upper right face popping out at you. And uh, you can get these reversals. So you can adopt one person for a period of time and then uh, switch over and go back and forth. So it's bi-stable. All that bi-stability isn't happening on the page, it's happening in the way you're perceiving it, the way you're constructing this cube in your head using Perception. And you can see we have these uh, explicit line contours and these forks to, to demonstrate that it does, doesn't involve these explicit contours per se. Let's just sit, rub out the uh, lines and see what happens and retain information only about the forks. But you can see here you're still able to make out the appearance of this rigid cube. Now it looks like it's situated behind this opaque piece of paper with all these holes punched in it. And that's because you are producing these, uh, these missing contours. You're drawing them inside your head. You're generating these subjective contours in order to construct this view in your mind, in your perception. There's another image here, which you may see is uh, three pack men or, or pack women. No. Alternatively, you may perceive it as three dark discs. And overlaying the disc is this equilateral triangle. <coughs> but it doesn't have explicit contours here. You're actually drawing those contours in, in your head, in order to perceive that triangle. You're essentially doing a dot to dot inside your head. We have our subjective triangle there, and this is just an ambiguous uh, image of, could be a corner of a room or a folded up paper bag. But if we add those two images together, we get a third image you see there on the right. And we instantly have this tetrahedron, three-dimensional structure, popping out at you. That wasn't present in the previous two images. You, couldn't, you could not have inferred the appearance of that based on the other two components alone. This is getting at the notion of Gestalt psychology, and it proposes that you cannot predict the appearance of complex forms simply by uh, adding up the individual components. You essentially see the forest before you see the trees. One of the uh, famous quotes that summarises the Gestalt position very well is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. 
Angus Dorfus were the first uh, psychologists to recognise that object recognition is uh, an extraordinary accomplishment or achievement, a great feat of human visual awareness. To demonstrate their position, they've uh, presented many uh, stimuli and illusions, some of them you may be familiar with. This is a German postcard from 1888, and it's an illustration of this uh, young lady, a very pretty young lady wearing this hat and her face is turned away from the illustrator. That's one way you could perceive it. Alternatively, you could make out the profile of this old hag in the image and allow me to point it out to you. If you imagine now for, for a moment that this structure here, previously the ear of the young lady, is now the eye of this old witch or old hag. And then we have the eyebrows above it, then her forehead, this big wart on this very big nose, and then coming down to her mouth, and then the necklace now becomes the the, the old hag's lips, and then we have her chin, and then her cheek here, and all the hair coming down. Right. Obviously, some of you are getting it now. The appearance of that old hag now right, is something new. You've constructed that in your mind, in the way you've grouped these features. You didn't experience it before. It's a good example of perceptual grouping. Here's another one. At this scale, both men and women report seeing uh, the profile of a woman's face with a big head. I blow it up. At this scale, there, there is anecdotal evidence to suggest that men have a lot of trouble finding the big face now in this area. <laughs> apparently, it's got something to do with to what they attribute this picture in here. You can see it as an eye, you can see the big head. If you see it as something else, well, you see something else. <laughs> and uh, this guy over here, he, he certainly can't see the big face either. He's fixated, obviously, on the butterfly. Oh. Here's another one. This is an easy one. It uh, looks like an illustration of this woman's face from farther on. It looks like there's very heavy illumination to her left. So from the right hand side of the display, then all going off into shadow to the left. Alternatively, you could uh, make up the appearance of a guy playing saxophone if you follow this contour here at the shadow down. You're following it all the way around that shadow and seeing that it encloses this, uh, this silhouette of a guy playing a saxophone. When you see, when you, when you perceive a guy playing a saxophone, this edge, common edge, becomes owned by that guy playing a saxophone. Everything else, all this white stuff, just become the background. Okay, so you don't perceive one state or the other. The guy playing saxophone for a woman's face. You don't perceive both at the same time. So you don't perceive this guy thrusting his saxophone into a woman's face. Because uh, that would just be wrong. Here's another one. This is a classic one. This is Ruben's bars. You see this uh, white structure here. It would appear like this big white chalice on my bars. Alternatively, uh, you could uh, attribute these contours here to being the outline of the profiles of two faces looking at that one another. If you adopt the percept of the faces, two dark faces looking at each other, people uh, having a chat in, you know, in, in a dark room with a well illuminated, highly illuminated room behind them, then uh, these, uh, these contours become owned by the faces. Coming down to the forehead, the eyes, the uh, nose, the eyes, the chin. If you adopt that percept, all the white stuff just goes in the background. Yeah. Good example of thin ground. Okay, the Gestaltists have uh, provided uh, various grouping laws to explain many of these uh, phenomena, as well as many others, and they're listed here. I'm just going to go through them. First one is the law of proximity. Now look here. All these. Uh, Spheres, you see, uh, are all proximal to one another in horizontal and <coughs> vertical uh, directions, and you group them to perceive this big grid or this big square structure. We now change the proximity so that we make lines one and two closer together and lines two and three further apart or more distal to one another, then you now perceive something different. You see three rigid rectangles. That's based on the law of proximity. You're grouping those 
consider a more street, which is a street to a hand of structures. Here, if we just return to our grid, but now change the colors across the rows, but preserve the colors down the columns, we now uh, group the information into these six vertical bars. And that's based on the law of similarity. Similar, in this case, similarity in color. <coughs> law of common fate is demonstrated here. All we've done is cut our big grid in half and have, we now have all the, uh, the, the balls in one grid moving in one direction with the same velocity and all the balls in the, in the, in the other grid, in the, say for example, the lower grid moving in the opposite direction to the, the top grid. You group those balls into the appearance of these two big rectangles moving back and forth, counterface to one another. That's because all the balls within each of those groups have the same velocity and direction of motion. So they have the same common fate. In this situation, you're grouping a common fate. This one we have uh, the law of pragmats or simplicity, which states that when you're confronted with a huge array of visual complexity, such as uh, thousands of hundreds of triangles and uh, these squares, you group the maximum number of uh, visual elements into the, the fewer number of global, globally perceivable structures. So you don't perceive many triangles and squares, you actually perceive two objects, that of a wireframe model of a, a ball and a wireframe model of this cube. The law of good continuation is shown here. We, we just returned to our crimson ball and cube demonstration. You can see that we have this occluding boundary producing this common edge. And that edge will tend to tend to be owned by the crimson ball. The reason for that is it exhibits the best good continuation. It, it completes beyond that common edge, closer to a straight line. So it tend to mean, because it observes good continuation, it means that uh, that common edge will be owned by the, uh, the principal in the foreground and the blue cube is therefore perceived to be in the background. It's also demonstrated here with this real world image. You see this uh, girl, she's carrying this bag with an ad on it and the legs on the ad are perfectly aligned with her own legs. And it almost looks like uh, you know, she's carrying some kind of X-ray bag or something, but she's actually uh, just, it's just an ad on it. And it looks like the, the, the ad on it is a part of her. Due to good continuation that, that those uh, uh, that have the boundaries. Well, we have uh, good continuation. We uh, can also have bad continuation, that's demonstrated here. We follow the contours of that uh, blue cube around, you can see that they terminate at these very close to 90 degree junctions at that common edge. That's what's referred to as T-junctions. And they provide information that uh, that common edge isn't owned by the cube. The cube is in the background. Based on T-junctions and good continuation, we can uh, start decomposing images so we can perceive stuff in this case here. You can see that uh, the outline of uh, the edges of uh, Michelangelo's day follow good continuation. You see that object in the foreground, whereas the background exhibits these junctions, these T-junctions. So you see the background has been in the distance. Law of familiarity is another one. And uh, what it states is that uh, when confronted with a huge uh, array of uh, the visual input that's uh, very complex, like these uh, black and white splotches, will tend to make sense of it and draw percepts based on what is familiar to us, our prior knowledge and stored knowledge. When you look at this, you should be able to make out the appearance of a Dalmatian dog, because uh, it should be familiar to you what a Dalmatian dog looks like. When you look at that, you should be able to see it. A Dalmatian dog. If you can't see a Dalmatian dog, then you need to go and become more familiar with them and spend more time on the weekends going out and playing with Dalmatian dogs. I can point it out, uh, it's slightly turned away from the illustrator, slightly obliquely. Here's its ear, there's its snout, and uh, its body coming down here, there's the hind legs there and the front leg. <coughs> So it's based, you're pulling out information about that uh, Dalmatian dog. 
using familiarity. This is getting at the notion of what is referred to as context and expectancy. And it was originally discovered by, uh, or demonstrated by Bugelsky and Alan Payne in 1961. And they presented their observers with this uh, ambiguous figure of this uh, rattish man. Now, I've preceded this presentation with uh, images of uh, uh, human faces or not human, so animals. When presented with uh, images of uh, faces, people interpreted the ambiguous figure of the rattish man as a bald man with glasses. But when uh, preceded with uh, images of animals, people adopted the percept of the rattish man as being an, an illustration of a rat. So it's uh, a very good demonstration that, uh, of how our stored knowledge in the basis of, of context, learned in the, in the immediate context, can influence our perception of uh, uh, ambiguous sensory input that we receive. The presentations of those uh, uh, human faces and the animals weren't presented simultaneously with this uh, ambiguous figure. They had to be stored and memorized in a particular context. And that primed a particular person over and over. That's a good example of how top-down knowledge can influence our uh, person of incoming sensory input. We're going to spend uh, the next few lectures uh, pulling this apart and looking at the problem of perception more and especially in how we are able to uh, decompose uh, images to extract information from them. I would like to end each of my lectures, lectures with a slide and I hope you'll be nice and sit there and, uh, and read it. And it's basically what you should know to be on the track to getting 100% from the exam based on what has been covered in this lecture. So you should know why perception is a hard problem and what we can learn about perceptual systems and how they break down from the particular illusions that we've covered in this lecture. You should also be aware of your gestalt grouping principles because they're really cool and you can create your own illusions if you want to mess with people's heads. Isn't that fantastic? You should also know some of the uh, evidence for how high level top-down knowledge can influence our perception of incoming sensory input. A good example of that was the hollow mask or hollow face illusion. And you use your prior knowledge of how a face should look to pull that inside face, inside out face, inside out so you sort of up right way around. Alright, I've had a really nice time lecturing to you guys. I really enjoyed your company. You guys have been really, really good. And uh, I've actually got a little video I want to present to you. I didn't make it, it's a bit of college humour. Next week we'll look at uh, something a little more biological. Uh, there's some free reading there. You don't have to do it. Uh, we, all that's going to be accessible is what's public in these lectures. Okay? But, uh, This is my apartment. And hey, this is my roommate, Jeff. Jeff, this is my new girlfriend. Oh, my God! Oh! Oh, my God! What is it? She's horrible. She's a beautiful woman. Huddle up. Dude, your girlfriend's an optical illusion. What? Look at her. What do you see? I see a beautiful woman wearing a beautiful hat. See? I see a horrible witch. I don't see that at all. Excuse me! Ma'am, could I see your driver's license? Oh, God. Thank you, honey. See? Horrible witch. Beautiful lady. Look, there's her ear. Oh, that's her eye. There's her chin. Dude, that's her nose. I don't see it. Though it is kind of weird they would issue her license when she's turned around. Oh, God! Oh, God! You see? Oh, my God. I see it. See what you were talking about before. Hey, do you think maybe I could go over there? Yeah, we're yeah. sure. Yeah. Hey, watch it. Sorry, guys, I thought I saw a face. It's the third time this week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your company, guys.